Hey, Boaz here with Next Pittsburgh. We're here at the Carnegie Museum of Art, or in a part of the museum you probably haven't seen before. We're checking out the Conservation Lab. And to tell us what's happening in the Conservation Lab, we're talking to an objects conservator, Mary Wilcop. Did I get that all right? Yeah, you got that perfect, Boaz. Thank you. Well, thanks for having us. So I'm seeing a lot of things around here. We've got some tools. We've got some art. We have a lot of art installations and exhibitions all the time, so we have a lot of art coming in and out of the lab. The last project we worked on was Carnegie International, our 58th run of the Contemporary Art Survey show that's up right now. And so a lot of the tools I have out today are examples of things that I use in kind of my everyday work as a conservator, and also things that we specially use for Carnegie International and all of the weird and wild artworks that are in that show. Well, it's interesting because I really only thought about conserving old things, like you're conserving like, you know, a Michelangelo or something, but you have to conserve things that are like brand new pieces of art also. Yeah, so the really interesting thing about working on a show like this, where we have a lot of younger artists who are kind of emerging in the field and developing their practice, and oftentimes for this show, making artwork here on site, we as the conservation and collections team are oftentimes kind of collaborators as well as caretakers of the artwork. But in terms of thinking about old things versus new things, yeah, totally. I think a lot of people think of conservation work as, you know, fixing fixing old things that happen to be broken and pointing to it. Yeah, I'm like, that looks old right there. Like, what's the story here? Yeah, so this is um, not related to Carnegie International. So this is actually a 16th century um, terracotta glazed uh, ceramic piece. It fell over at one point about 30 years ago and broke into hundreds of pieces. And so... Uh, the conservator at the time in the early 1990s spent an entire year putting this back together and essentially restoring it um, with special conservation adhesives that we use and special in-painting mediums. This is a UV light, almost like a black light. Um, and you can see that in certain lighting techniques, Whoa. particular materials become more visible than they are. And so you can see some of the gaps that were filled with special conservation materials. Up here on top, you can see actually the, all of the pieces um, and the fills that had to be made in between them. And the reason we use materials like that is so that if you, you know, if a conservator 50 years from now is needing to examine that object, they can see, oh, I see where the restoration was. The visitor doesn't see it when it's on display, but we see it using our special tools. So that's like a really classic example of conservation work, yeah. right? You have that's what I think of. You've got like an old 16th yeah. century thing, you're fixing it. Yeah, so right. It broke, we put it back together, and that is part of our training. So artists nowadays are not just working in terracotta or paint or traditional media. They're pulling things from the trash bin. They're pulling things from off the shelf at uh, you know, big box stores, and those are not materials that the, um, you know, the creator designed to last forever. So we have to really be good at understanding and identifying what the materials are in the artwork in order to understand their vulnerabilities and say, you know, adjust the light levels so they're low, so we are able to slow the aging of, of a particularly, like, fugitive pigment or something like that. So we're, we're thinking of a lot of... You see a fugitive things. pigment? <laughs> Gosh, yeah. that sounds exciting. So that's just a term that means um, it uh, is susceptible to, to color change okay. or fading with light exposure. So if you've ever, you know, done a work with, like, a... A, a marker um, or, you know, marked something with a permanent, a permanent marker or Sharpie, you know, years ago, and you look at it and it's almost completely faded away. Um, I like how you're like an object conservator scoffing at the permanent <laughs> marker, like, ha ha, they don't even know. They don't even know. They have no idea. And so what are some of these tools that you've got that you're using, I guess, in your everyday work? So um, some of the tools I have here are uh, cotton swabs. We use that a lot when we're cleaning something. Um, if you have like a sculpture with ear holes, you got to get in there. Oh yeah, we have ears all over the place. No, I'm. <laughs> no, it's just um, a really handy way to kind of make a custom tool for yourself for cleaning. You can make them as big or small as you want. We're a very small field. You know, we, we don't, we're, there's only a couple thousand of us, so we're not a huge market. So yeah. 
usually people aren't making tools specially for conservators. So we're oftentimes adapting tools from other kind of parts of you know, other, other uses. So you kind of have to think about what the material or what the object is designed for, and then you can kind of adapt it for your own purposes. Right. These are actually cutoffs from galvanized steel tubes that we bought at a commercial um, hardware store. Looks like something you can get at Home Depot. Yeah, yeah, exactly. They are from Home Depot. <laughs> so we have an artist, Christian Yampeta, who works on um, very large sheets of paper, and he does charcoal drawings, and they're very beautiful and interesting. Um, and he was one of our featured artists in the show. The way that he displays his work at his studio is he has these big sheets kind of, sometimes he has them draped over lamps or, or just kind of taped to the wall. So how do we hang that in a way that kind of replicates how he's choosing to display them, but they're also safe for the art for the run of the six month show. So for, for that um, particular artwork, we came up with a strategy of using these steel ductwork um, essentially wrapping them in the same type of paper from Dick Blick that Christian was working on. So it's a very close color match. So a lot of our artists in Carnegie International are working with organic materials, sometimes materials that were once alive. Um, or that well, like I saw in one of the pieces I've seen, there's like all the gourds and stuff like that. Exactly. So certain objects are using these living materials. And so because we are a collecting institution, we, you know, we have our own collection and we take care of it. So we are also trying to protect our own collections from things that might be coming in, carrying pests or um, or mold or you know some type of fungal spore. You get one of those like sniffing dogs, like they have at the airport or something, with all the air the oh, nice. artwork that's coming in. <laughs> that would be a great strategy. I know some staff members that would really <laughs> really like that. Um, but that, no, I'm the dog, I'm the sniffer <laughs> in this scenario. So yeah, actually it's, it's funny that you say that smell is a really big component of when we're kind of assessing something. So for example, uh, Daniel Lee's wonderful installation in the Grand Staircase uses a lot of naturally dyed fabrics. And in the process that they use to create their work, um, they'll incorporate fungal growth and kind of the imprint that spores might leave as they're as they're growing one of the um, cloths that came in was like a little a little extra funky so um, they and myself decided to do a heat treatment to try and stabilize the <laughs> the whatever living little guy was in the is in yeah the you just want to make sure the fungus stays on this artwork and doesn't spread to any other artwork yeah and then kind of we yeah, yeah we, we, we kill we, yeah. we kill them um, and we use a lot of, we had to use a lot of different methods for this. Um, like for instance, uh, Patricia Billy's uh, installation work in the Charity Randall Gallery has these very large tree branches that we have suspended from the ceiling. She wanted to have tree branches hold her puppets that she was bringing in. And so we actually got those branches from outside of the museum, but we can't just bring those inside because they could have wood boring insects. Sure, you could that... have moths on there, all kinds of stuff you don't totally. want in the museum. So what we did for that was, um, one of our approaches is heat treatment. If you reach a certain temperature, um, and, you know, all throughout the object, then you have a very high kill rate for any potential insects. So um, this is actually a tool that I have borrowed from our Carnegie Museum of Natural History colleagues. Um, it's a baking oven. Or I you're going to say you borrowed it from the cafe or something. This is where they make the croissants in the morning. No, this is another example of kind of using a non-conservation tool as a conservation tool. So this is a proofing oven. It allows us to adjust the temperature and the humidity inside the chamber. The big bundle of black plastic is because some of the branches we used were several feet long and obviously wouldn't fit in here. So we had to make a giant tent using plastic and blankets. To make like just a massive oven. To make a giant oven. Here is Edgar Kalal's uh, installation work uh, as part of CI. And you can see it's this really beautiful arrangement of terracotta vessels made from um, you know, uh, his home in Central America, incorporating apple tree and peach tree branches. 
and rose petals as part of the kind of ritual that he uses to make these kind of communication devices. So we actually, we have a team of art installers who regularly change out the water and the petals because it doesn't seem like that much, but it's actually several, uh, maybe like 10 garbage bin, large garbage bins full of water that's used for the installation. Um, so it's a lot of water. I have a smaller oven. Right now it's full of insect traps. Uh, we trap insects around our museum in order to keep a log of our pest species that we, that we have because, you know, all spaces have insects to a yeah. certain extent. I actually have a couple of traps over there if you want to go look at them. Gosh, are there insects in them? Yeah, how do you feel about bugs? I feel pretty good. Okay. This is exciting. Oh my gosh, so what, what have you noticed in the trends in the insect populations at the at the museum? Well, nothing too alarming. You know, it's very typical of, um, you know, of a, of a museum space. Um, but I thought it might be fun to kind of show you what, what some guys look like under the microscope. This is a really interesting species called, called an odd beetle. And there are, on the right is a, is a larva, and on the left is a male odd beetle. And um, the female actually looks exactly like the larva. So they're kind of a mismatch pair, even though they're the same species. They're not going to present any risk to our collections. Yeah, you can see there's not much going on on the traps, which is exactly like what we like to see. Yeah, yeah so a lot of the gourds are packed with these seeds and dirt that are being fed by the fermented water that are then kind of allowing them to grow. Did you know that they would be growing? No. <laughs> I wish I could say yes, we knew about everything, but this was a very fun surprise. Yeah. Did the artist expect that? Well, so the interesting thing was that, so the artist is Vietnamese and sp spoke very little English and none of us spoke Vietnamese. So we had a translator for a couple of days and then we were kind of on our own working together. So it was a lot of like gestural communication. So we, um, we didn't <laughs> we didn't understand the the full extent of what was meant by by the term garden so we do have actually like a real garden here um with with things sprouting up and growing and living and dying so um you can kind of smell some of the fermented smell um, and you can see the water flowing through the tubes and the beans uh, and another thing that's really neat about the installation which was also kind of a surprise is that part some of the gourds actually move and twitch and you can hear, if you get the mic close, you can hear the different sounds it's making as it's kind of... Can you hear that, Annie? Oh, yeah. <laughs> so it's really, it's like, it's a very, it's probably one of our more alive feeling artworks. In the I mean, show. it's growing. It's literally alive. It is, it is. And it presents a lot of interesting challenges for us as the collections team. We want to maintain the artwork and allow it to kind of be itself over the course of the exhibition. Um, but we also want to make sure, you know, uh, it's not fermenting too much or creating, um, you know, any anything hazardous potentially so we're just we're keeping an eye on it and we expect it to grow and change and you know when peop people come at the beginning of the show if they come halfway through it might be it might be a little bit different than the way they saw it before so it's really interesting to have a piece like that. The whole show is so cool and it's just like in thinking about all it takes to hang everything and do it in a thoughtful way and make sure you know you don't come in and seeing rotten rose petals it's yeah. just like there's so much to think about so thank you so much for walking us through all of this yeah thanks so much Buzz. it was really great to get to talk to you uh, about this show and on all of the work that we we did and are actively doing to um, keep it going